Welcome everyone back to this week's episode of the Lady Landlords podcast. I have a very special guest today, my own actual attorney here, Jay Zimner. Jay, thank you for joining us today. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing very well. When I'm with you, I'm doing great. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, that's why we get along and work so well together. So why don't you take a second and introduce yourself for our audience here? Well, thank you again very much for having me. And to those that are listening, uh, I'll try to be brief with my bio. Um, I am originally from Arizona. I grew up uh, going to school in Phoenix, went to undergraduate in Tucson at the University of Arizona, where I focused my studies on uh, English lit and Italian for really no other so purpose, close. right. <laughs> for really no other purpose than trying to find a way to distinguish myself so that when I applied to law school, I may be lucky enough to find my way to New York, which was ultimately the goal all along. And I'm convinced, and I tell people this story all the time, the reason why I was so enamored and so attracted to New York City was because of the countless hours my mother sat me in front of Sesame Street. <laughs> and I needed to experience that for myself. So however it was that I was gonna get to New York City, uh, that was going to be my path. And of course, I had two adoring parents who always found the time to try to share with me life's lessons and things that I should abide by. And one of those was you need to have a postgraduate degree of some kind. So because I didn't know what I wanted to do, law school was the perfect <laughs> choice, right? <laughs> and there I was. I found myself in New York in my early 20s attending Cardozo Law and um I have a, a very untraditional path to where I am today. And I'll just briefly tell your listeners that when I graduated from law school, for better or worse, I started my own practice. Um, much of that was out of necessity, um, but also was the only way that I really saw myself ever practicing law was to do it my way, um, the hard way, I guess, in many ways. Um, but here I am, 18 years later, after having graduated, I have a boutique law firm in Midtown Manhattan. We focus primarily on residential real estate transaction, and a lot of the litigation that we handle is also around real estate, but we also have a general civil litigation branch as well. That's really interesting because I, just knowing you and working with you for years now, I actually can't see you at like another law firm. Like it just to me fits so well for you to have your own practice. I kind of can't see that any other way. So I'm glad you decided to take the hard route <laughs> and do it that way. So what kind of drew you towards real estate? Was there any reason that that ended up being your concentration in law? That's another uh, very quick story, I hope. <laughs> um, I had been doing a lot of networking in the city to drum up business of whatever kind. I was one of those old school throwback junkyard dogs, family lawyers, where once I helped you resolve a legal issue, I wanted to be there for whatever legal issue came up in your life. So I had started to do a lot of networking and my primary focus was as either general litigator, which wasn't specific enough, uh, I'm sorry, general practitioner, which wasn't specific enough, or civil litigator. And I got my fair share of clients and disputes that I was able to resolve or try cases, but I'd always get a tap on my shoulder for real estate transaction. And I said, no, we really don't focus on real estate transaction, but I can refer you to someone who does. And every week there seemed to be this great volume and need for real estate. And I kept passing it on. And I finally said to myself, right around 2007, 2008, and there's a whole story behind that, but I'll spare your audience and you, um, <laughs> was I just decided that I was going to learn how to do it for myself. Hmm. And I started to interact with those that were doing it and started to ask questions. And I was able to get a lot of very good advice from my mentor, Neil Dobshinsky, who's still a major part of my life, who you know. Mm -hmm. yes. And we started to work on residential real estate together. And it just grew and grew and grew and grew. And now it's, I would probably have to say it's my primary focus of my everyday practice and my everyday life. That's amazing. It's funny how people end up kind of falling in these different directions. I know myself and many of our listeners never actually expected to end up in real estate either, but then yet here we are, right? <laughs> yeah. And, so. and look for, for a lot of people who have the fortitude and have the ability to delve into something like real estate, it has made not necessarily me, but a lot of my clients very wealthy. When you do it smart and you go about it in the way that you're comfortable with, I think there are a lot of people that can find a very nice living is available to you in real estate. And I'm sure we're going to get into that later in your podcast. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been rewarding to say the least. 
Yeah. And you clearly get to work with some amazing people. So <laughs> absolutely. You being one of them. And I'm going to get to you by before this is all over, because I want to talk about your story, too, of and course, how I no. feel about you. <laughs> we'll get into that. Well, one of the so one of them, the questions now being in real estate and having that be your primary focus, how important is it for investors like our listeners to work with an attorney that focuses just on real estate? Is it OK to find kind of a jack of all trades? Well, it's always, um, I think, important uh, without overstating the obvious mm -hmm. to work with a professional that, you know, spends most of their time reading, learning, and experiencing what there is to know and do and be out there in the world of real estate or whatever um, specific field it may be that you're involved in. I mean, if you were wanting to go in for heart surgery, you wouldn't go to a brain surgeon. Um, yeah. So there's something to be said about the credentials and the experience that your professional brings to the table. Um, I mean, I, at one point was a jack of all trades, master of none kind of guy. And I got away with it because it took me time to obviously gradually become, and I steer away from the word expert because that just doesn't sit well with me. Although I do spend most of my time now focused on real estate. There's always something to be learned, something to be gained by my clients or others that I work with. Um, but I do feel like I have a lot to offer my clients in the way of guidance, counseling, mm -hmm. uh, uh, observation, analysis, due diligence, and things that are important to the developer, to the person that's involved in real estate. So it, I think it is important to have someone that you trust and uh, recognize their knowledge base and their experience, because it's going to help you make better decisions for yourself. All I picture, guys, I forget what show it is. I want to say it's like The Simpsons, where, you know, there for some reason, Homer had to go find an attorney and was driving by like a strip mall. And it was like, attorney at law, laundromat, and like handyman, right? And it's like, that's probably not the attorney that you would want to find for, for transactions. You really want to make sure to find somebody that's knowledgeable and really can be the, we won't use an expert, but the most knowledgeable in a subject that, that you really need support with. So, okay, that kind of answers that first question. So now I know that I need to find somebody that is a real estate attorney, someone that focuses on real estate, but then there's still a lot of different attorneys out there. What would be some questions that a new investor would want to ask a real estate attorney to see if they're a good fit to work with them? Well, uh, another good question, which I think dovetails off your first question, mm -hmm. uh, which is, do you need to find yourself getting advice from uh, an expert or experienced person in the particular field that you're interested in? And when it comes to real estate, you uh, oftentimes want to ask your lawyer how much experience do they have dealing with the kind of problem or question that you have? And there's nothing wrong with asking it. And, you know, don't be too critical or judgmental of the answer, but, you know, try to get a sense of whether or not this person is capable, competent, and trustworthy to help you with what generally, at least in my world, happens to be the largest investment of most of my clients' lives. So if you have the faith that that person has the experience and the knowledge base to help you through it, or is at least willing enough to express to you that, no, they haven't had that question come across their desk, but they're willing to research it for you and put in the effort to get you the answers from those that they're connected with, then that, I think, shows a lot uh, about the person's character, the person's trustworthiness, and whether or not that professional is going to add value to the decisions that you're making, which are extremely important. So I'm going to kind of throw you in the hot seat here a little bit. Do you, uh -oh. remember, do you remember how we got connected? I do, because okay. I, I love connecting dots. And I love how most paths end up somehow, some way, going back to an original source. But am I allowed to to talk about her just openly? Because I do love her. Of course. Doctor, no, no, absolutely, of course. It, it was Dr. Rhodes. Uh, and I hope she's uh -huh. listening. Uh, she went to school with my wife. Uh, wow. She's a psychologist. My wife's a psychologist. And she was going through a personal situation. And she had asked one other student while she was in school whether or not Allie's husband could mm -hmm. help her. And of course, I jumped at the opportunity to see, and, and I'm mostly that kind of a person. I would like to help people. Uh, that's a passion of mine. So if something is troubling someone, I like to see if there's anything that I can do to be uh, uh, of help with or, or a resource. So she did, Dr. Rhodes came to me and she said, I'm dealing with a very personal situation. And I could really use your analysis. And our relationship began. And we went through several years of very emotional litigation. Uh, it was a family-related matter. 
And we were successful in our efforts to do what she believed was in the best interests of her and certain other people. And I think we did it in an admirable way, a cost-effective way. And we ultimately were hugely successful. And as a result of that, our friendship was born. And she was willing to share, I guess, my name with you at mm -hmm. a time where you were looking to delve into one of your first big investments. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my recollection of how we got to know each other and become friends as well. Yes. So it was Dr. Rhodes that had put us in touch. And for, for those that are listening that are part of the Lady Landlords group, some of you know that I have actually been to small claims or in legal situations over the past few years um, for various things that have kind of come up with some of the properties. And Jay and I actually connected. I had already bought our first duplex right. and I used a different attorney, which was <laughs> clearly my biggest mistake there. And that attorney made quite a few mistakes. That was also somebody that was, you know, a friend of a family member. So sometimes that whole, you're a little too close, not really the person, because honestly, I'm quite sure my family has never spoken to her since the incident with our closing. Oh, yeah. And also since we took her to small, we took yes. our attorney to small claims. So I remember that I was looking for a, someone that could help me not only fix that situation of what my attorney did that was wrong, but you might also remember that that was when I got the title company had actually missed that $7,000 water bill that now my husband and I got stuck with. So I was not happy with my title company. I was not happy with my attorney. And the first time Jay and I, when you, when we spoke on the phone about my situation, the one thing that I will never forget that you said to me is you said that one of your favorite things to do was to make people's lives miserable when they wronged other people. <laughs> and I was like, this is my attorney. This is the guy that I have got to work with. If this is his, like, if that's his motto, I was like, this is the guy that I've got to work with that I can see I turned your face red there. Yeah, you know what? You, you make me laugh because that's like my tough guy persona, which I know <laughs> that in certain crisis modes, that's what the, uh, the that's what the recipient of my, word, of my, my words want to hear. They want to hear that I'm going to be yeah. tough and make life miserable for the person that made their life miserable because it is a lot of emotion. It's tit for tat. It's eye for an eye. And you were mm -hmm. pissed. You were yes. angry. You felt wronged. And who's going to be the pit bull in my life? Who's going to protect me because I have felt unprotected up until this point and I'm getting screwed as a result. No, but what I, what made me red and what makes <laughs> me laugh is because deep down I'm a lover. I'm a fixer. I'm the guy yeah. who likes to get things done amicably, persuasively. Mm -hmm. I like to use other tools other than weapons that can hurt others. I believe that there's always a way to resolve problems and issues. This happened to spiral out of control and was costing you and your husband a lot of money. So we really mm -hmm. needed to put an end to that. And there's always room and there's a place for it because our society is based on it, right? We have a court system for a reason. We have lawyers for a reason. And sometimes you have to get tough with people who aren't going to be persuaded to do right. And my job is to help people find their right. <laughs> and so that was my job for you. But, but ultimately I'm a, I'm just a, I'm a softy. I'm like a thoughtful no. guy. I'm not looking to really make people's lives miserable unless they F with the people that I love and care for. And you were one of those people that I really cared for. And we yeah. got to know each other very, very quickly. And your story resonated with me. And I felt just so horribly that you had had the experience that you had, which so easily could have been avoided had it been handled a little differently. So I'm glad that you spotlighted that and in a way complimented me for the kind of rough, tough focus I had. But uh, generally speaking, I try to avoid those kinds of conflicts because I tend to, and I think this is important for your listeners to hear, and it goes back to a previous question. How do you choose your attorney? Choose an attorney who's not in the business of law. And I mean that to, to mean I could sell myself to a lot of people for a lot of money on a daily basis. And at the end of the day, I think my reputation would suffer. And I think my clients would be angry with me with the bills that they get at the end of the day. I talk myself out of a lot of different potential opportunities for myself as an attorney to help people because I give them the advice that they need. It's 10 minutes of my time. They can handle it themselves probably better and more efficiently than I can. So save your money. Don't spend it on me. Here's what I think you should do. If that doesn't work, yes, I'm your fallback. But I like to talk people out of having to use me as much as I do talking them into using me. <laughs> that also, to me, it kind of reminds me of that, the law of reciprocity. 
where if you're able to, and there's been a couple of times that I've called you with stuff and I guess maybe I am more of a little bit of a pit bull that I'm like, fine, I'm going to see this person or I'm going to make this person's lives miserable. I maybe have more of that attitude. So you definitely spoke to me the right way in what I needed to hear at that time. But there's been many times when I've called you about situations that you've actually kind of advised me that I don't necessarily need you to need to hire you to fix that situation. And you've given me other strategies of how I can fix something. And that's also why I keep coming back to you because <laughs> for then that next property, because I'm like, well, he was able to give me this advice. He w- was able to walk me through that situation and tell me how to avoid litigation in these certain situations and how to save me time and money. So, you know what, on the contrary, now you're the person I want to give my money to because you've done those things for me and spent that 10 minutes on this situation or this situation. So isn't that kind of funny how it all kind of comes back to you? I'm, you I'm so glad that you're appreciative of that. And I guess many people could sit here and, and analyze what I've said to you on this podcast and on this show, which is he's just a salesman, right? He's figured out a way to get people into his grasp and into his world and into his life in a way that resonates with them. And look, I picked up on the fact that you were tough as nails. You <laughs> are not going to take shit from no one, right? And um nope. And that has, by the way, served you quite well. You've been successful. You have a a loving marriage from what I can tell. And you have your family who adores you. And you take responsibility for more than the people that are just in your immediate circles. You have really deeply connected friendships with the people that are in your life. And I feel a connection with you beyond client attorney because of the way that you are. Your personality type really works well with the kind of person that I am both professionally and personally. But I have to read very quickly a person's personality type in just a few short minutes of being on the phone with them. I need to know, do I need to be that person I was for you on the phone or do I need to dial it back and tone it down? And I think 95% of the time I get it right. And therefore they keep coming back to me with everything. And that can be good and bad. And 5% of the time, I probably turn people off like he's too soft for me, or he's not focused enough on me, or he's too busy for me, or that's too tough. You you know, that's what you get in sales. And I'm not suggesting that I'm selling anybody. I'm a professional. I'm not a salesman necessarily, but I do sell ideas. I do sell Mm -hmm. the law. And I do sell people's comfort in putting their faith and trust in me as an agent to go to bat for them. They've gone to bat for themselves. It hasn't worked with their approach or they're too close to the situation for to, to, to be, uh, have this, the same kind of an impact as hiring someone like a lawyer. And I take it to the next level, whatever that next level may be. So uh, I just wanted to point that out, that that's funny that you, you, you brought it full circle. <laughs> like, yeah. And- I mean, that is, and uh, as entrepreneurs, not only the two of us, but also any other real estate investor that's listening to this, when you are an entrepreneur, we are part of sales, right? Even when we make offers buying buying property, we're still somehow trying to make that offer in a way that's going to make us look like that best, the best package, the best thing to really purchase, right? So it, it is kind of crazy how sales does infiltrate so many different industries rather than being like, oh, I sell like a physical product. It still does end up in our lives in every way. So reading people really is an important point of what we all do. Yeah. And I just want your listeners to know who are involved in real estate. And I've I've not lectured on this, but I've spoken on this subject that sales is not a dirty word. There's nothing wrong with selling something that you wholeheartedly believe will help the person in their life and in their endeavor. Right. So that to me is not a sale. That is an education. You are an informer for a product or a service that you believe will actually better someone's life. You're not selling snake oil, right? You're not, I mean, and there are certain people that are probably out there that are doing wrong by others, but if you truly believe in who you are and what product you stand by and you are selling it, that's a positive thing, not a negative thing. So I want everyone to feel more comfortable around a word that maybe has negative connotation, um, which I've gotten myself to believe has a very positive influence in people's lives. To be good at sales is to be an informant, to be an educator, uh, to want to help people. Yeah. And I think that's something that we do have to kind of watch out for because there are other people that will come across more that know that they necessarily cannot offer you the service that you specifically need. And then that's where I feel like sales, unfortunately, gets that bad connotation. So that's something that I feel like we kind of need to use our gut if we're speaking to somebody or interviewing a service provider within our within our investment kind of framework here that we're like, no, this person just is just trying to sell me on, 
you know, just trying to get my money, but they really actually aren't going to be the right person to help me through that certain situation. What other red flags would you say there would be for someone to say, this is maybe not the right attorney for me? Hmm. I would uh, just off the cuff, just to give you the first thing that came into my mind is trust your gut. Yeah. The first, the feeling that you have when you're in someone's office or on the phone with that person, you know, and keep in mind that you may be a little bit hungry. Like I was before I jumped on the show (laughs) and your mood can be, can be altered as a result, Uh, or you might be having a bad day or your, your situation is plaguing you because it's creating consternation and it's creating all sorts of stress. If you can remove some of those other elements, then, and you're sitting there and you're face to face with someone, how does that person make you, make you feel? How do you feel in the environment that they've created? What are they providing you uh, on an emotional level? And I would say that there's a lot to be said for trusting your gut. I think people choose their attorneys and their professionals and, mm-hmm. and even the people as important as a doctor, um, not necessarily. And I would, maybe I shouldn't say what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> there are plenty of people that can do a brain operation and successfully do so. It's who do you want operating on your brain? Who is making you saying the right things and making you feel comfortable with the success that they're hopefully inevitably going to have? And a lot of those decisions are based on who you like, who you feel most comfortable with. And sometimes a bedside manner isn't as important to a certain Mm -hmm. person who's just looking to get the, the boxes checked and the I's dotted and the T's crossed. And that's perfectly fine. Not everybody's going to have a certain charm or charisma and that some things that we do in life don't require it. Other people are comforted by knowing that if this person's also going to be able to get me to the end line, but they're also going to be able to comfort me in other ways or talk to my mom or dad in a way that I know they would appreciate, or the people that I've got to convince to put money into an investment with me, they're going to take the time to have a certain style or a certain way about them that's going to benefit you, then that's an important thing to consider when you're sitting down with an attorney to hire. So there is no right or wrong. I think as long as you get to your end goal, that's the key. But a part Mm -hmm. of that is the relationship that you expect to have developed between you and your attorney that's going to ultimately drive you as to who you decide to hire. So one of the things that I preach a lot in Lady Landlords is for people when they're looking for deals to make sure they understand what the criteria is that they're looking for, right? You can't just say like, hey, is this a good deal? Well, what's a good deal to me is something that's a good deal is different to you. Mm -hmm. So it almost kind of sounds like that same thing. To me, when I look for an attorney, when I was looking for a realtor, all those other vendors, I knew what criteria I wanted. I needed, most important thing for me personally is responsiveness. Um, Jay knows that I usually do not start with any type of salutation. I'm not a, hi, good morning, how are you doing type person. I'm more like, yo, I need this. Um, <laughs> that's it. And I don't care if it's six o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock at night, I'm still going to send my message. You have the choice not to respond. That's just how I function. And I, I know I look for people that they can set boundaries because I'm not going to follow them. Um, and then so responsiveness and communication is really important to me. And I need to feel confident that the other person has the knowledge where they can handle something because I don't babysit people. So I need to say, okay, hey, this is the problem. Great. Jay's taking care of it. I know and I have full trust that Jay is going to take care of it. And I feel that same way about my realtor, Michael, or other vendors that I work with. And those are two things for criteria that's really important to me. I want my professional to be able to take things off my plate because they are the subject matter expert for that issue. And also, I want to know what the hell's going on. Um, And I will call you until you tell me. (laughs) And and I'm glad that you mentioned that because that's something that I've embedded into my initial presentation or conversation with a prospective client is to set expectations. And I have said to them that I'm going to give you my cell phone. And I expect that if you have a need at whatever time of day or any day of the week, that you please utilize what I'm providing you with, which is instant access to me. However, if I'm sleeping... (laughs) It might take me a couple of hours to see your text, but I will get back to you. So just give me that little benefit of the doubt. And if you can live with that, Becky, yeah. <laughs> and you'll be like, dude, I'm so glad you said that because now we're on each other's page. Like, you know that I'm going to text you and email you whenever I want yeah. or I have a need. And it, you'll usually get back to me right away, which I love. The responsiveness mm-hmm. and attention is what most people want and, and like, but because I've expressed to you, like, if I don't get back to you, it's not because I don't love you or I don't care about your yeah. situation. I will. And if I don't, hold my feet to the fire. 
protect yourself by protecting me. Say, Jay, I texted you like three hours ago. You're always so good about texting me back, but I haven't heard back from you. Are you okay? Like, don't immediately jump at your professionals in throat if you believe that they have your best interest in mind. If they've gotten too busy for you, then they no longer have your best interest in mind. And then it may be time to move on for no other reason than you're not a big enough fish in their frying pan or they've moved on to other things. And there's time for a new conversation. It's a relationship like any other good mm -hmm. communication is the best way to know whether or not your attorney has your best interest in mind. I like that. Yeah, you probably regret giving me your cell phone. No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Not but, at all. But let's let's switch gears. I mean, look, 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 look what's come out of the, the, the relationship. I'm now on your yeah. podcast for Lady Landlords. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, and Lady Landlords wasn't even a thing when we first met. I didn't very I never thought we would be here. So crazy how things work. But let's switch gears a little bit to one time when I did have to call you. Oh. Um, and I was really impressed yeah. that you actually not only answered my call, but walked me through that situation. So one of our most popular topics within Lady Landlords is the idea of emotional support animals, right? This has definitely become a hot button topic over the past couple of years. So um, is there anything that you would just kind of like to say or to address with ESAs to start with? Yeah, I would, I would just let everyone know that's listening or, or watching or both um, to just be very, very careful with regard to everything that could be considered discriminatory. Everything and anything is a hot button topic these days. Um, you can't be too careful. There's no such thing as being too careful. And unfortunately, in some respects, um, it's prevented and curtailed uh, certain kinds of relationships from being formed and positive business relationships. But the pendulum swings and we're in a moment in time where we have to be very, very respectful very open-minded to ideas and thoughts and the way that people live their lives and their needs and their wants and just be on, err on the side of caution. And if you have a question about something that you should address that could potentially create a controversy or be, uh, be a conflict, reach out to your professional, reach out to Becky, reach out to your lawyer or whomever, whomever you trust to, to first discuss it with someone else, because you may not necessarily have the sense of it being controversial. And the last thing you want to do is put your foot in your mouth. So you bring up an interesting point, emotional support animals, right? Um, mm -hmm. A number of people have asked my wife, who's a psychologist to write a letter for them so that they can travel with a dog, right? And airlines have been very, very careful with whom they say no to, and if they even say no at all. So mm -hmm. Becky, your question is a good one because there are a lot of people who are tenants who have emotional support animals for the right reasons, right? Not everybody's a fraud or a phony. They're not just suggesting that they have this cute dog and that now all of a sudden the only way to get their dog into the apartment or the unit or the room or whatever it is that you may be renting uh, is an emotional support animal. Um, so it's okay to be, to question it, but don't be critical and don't assume that everybody's out there that is a fraud or is a liar about it. Um, you yourself experienced this as a landlord. And I know that I was yes. one of your first calls, if not your very first call very first. <laughs> with regard to this, because you had a great deal of concern. I think your listeners would probably love to hear the story that you could tell uh, with some of my help in the background. And I'm, I'm happy to fill in where you want, but I think you should tell your listeners your story. Sure. So this situation happened right at the beginning of the pandemic last year. It was actually right in the end of March 2020. We had a vacancy. Clearly, the world was a little bit up in air. So we had a couple that had come to us that were um, that were looking for a place to be able to move in by the first. So we they were worried that they weren't going to be able to find a place in time. So we said, you know, it really depends on you. We can move forward with the application process. And they did. They were, they completed everything that we needed. They filled out our application, did the credit check. Everything went very smoothly. We were really impressed with actually how responsive they were. So we were able to get the lease signed and we had the lease signed. They paid the security deposit and the first month's rent. So that now is our executed contract. They came back a couple of days later to move in. And when they came back to move in and to get the keys from us, it was odd that when my husband and I went out to meet them, that it was only the woman of the couple that was there. And I think that's funny because the first thing I'm going to do if I'm going to move is I'm going to go find my big, strong husband to carry all the boxes, <laughs> right? There's no way I'm not having him for moving. 
So I was really surprised that it was just her that showed up. Then when she showed up, she had her car filled with boxes, but she didn't take anything out of the car when we went inside to go do the move-in inspection. Same thing. First thing I would have done would be like, here, Becky, here's this box. I would have looked at my husband and done the same thing and given him a bunch of stuff to carry upstairs to this apartment. She took nothing but a folder. And I was like, okay, that's odd. That's not what I would, that's not the first thing I would move into a new apartment, but okay, fine. Went in, we did our move in checklist and went around, took pictures and everything like that. And I remember I even showed her like, here's this key for this, this key for this, and this key for this. And for some reason, I just kind of put the keys on the windowsill next to me. And at that time, that was when she mentioned, she goes, oh, the reason my partner's not here is he was a little embarrassed to talk to you about this. He does have a certain condition and therefore needs a, a, a support animal. And we didn't, it was actually their attorney that told them not to tell us until the move in. And meanwhile, she wasn't, she didn't tell us what the animal was. And it was a very odd conversation. You could tell how nervous she was. And then when I had asked her, she kind of skirted around the name of the animal, but then finally came out to, um, to realize that it was actually a pit bull of a rather large size that they would be looking to move into this multifamily in the top floor of a multifamily. We were a little concerned because I had already looked into this and I knew that this was something that my homeowner's insurance would have a problem with. So like I said, the best thing that I probably did that day was I happened to have those keys still next to me. So I like kind of covered my hand back up on it and kind of like took those keys back. And I said, listen, like I really need to now readdress this with my attorney due to our lease purposes. And I'll, I'll need to speak to my homeowner's insurance policy. So please give me some, some time. So we walked out of the apartment. She went back home and I called Jay at like nine o'clock on like a Saturday morning and he actually answered the phone. <laughs> we never, I was like all ready to, you know, when like, you know, you're going to get somebody's voicemail. So you're all prepared <laughs> in what you're going to say. Um, I was already prepared to do that. And you were just like, hello. And I was like, oh, I was like waiting for the like, hello. Oh, gotcha. Please leave a message. <laughs> and then I realized it was actually you. Um, do you, do you remember that? Yeah, no, that of, point? Cor of course. And I want to make sure that your listeners realize that the property that you are talking about is one that you had been occupying with your husband. Correct. It was where you were living. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know I, I, I got a call on Saturday morning. And like I, I've said to you many times, I want to be as available to you as I possibly <laughs> can be. And I knew that if you were calling me on a Saturday at 9 AM, that there must be something truly wrong. Cause mm -hmm. look, you know, the etiquette, right? Like you're going to bother your attorney when you think it's most appropriate, probably Monday through Friday, maybe 8 30 AM to seven o'clock at night would be appropriate for most attorneys. I don't know. Maybe that's a New York city standard, probably. certainly the standard I set, but if I get a 9 AM call from you <laughs> on a Saturday, Saturday, I'm picking up because that's an emergency. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And to you, it was, and I could totally understand why, given where you were at currently in the situation that you were in about to hand over the keys to a tenant that had already signed a lease, but never disclosed an emotional support animal. So continue your story. Sorry. Sure. So one of the things that Jay, that you would recommend at that time was actually to review what our lease was and what obligations were within that. Because what ended up happening in that situation was that these tenants then did not allow us the ability to do our, our due diligence, right? Now having, once again, that animal there, um, and I am pro-animal, but once again, this was something that when we were given paperwork, since I work in the medical field, it was something that it was very easy to kind of notice that there were issues with the paperwork that was handed into us. So now I have people that are expecting to move in that day. It was also very hard for me not to be able to move forward with them knowing that, you know, this was the place that they planned on moving. But I now, as the landlord, was not given the ability to do the due diligence that I needed to, which meant to check on the paperwork, especially when I, when I, for my, for my experience in the medical field, already now had questions about this. This was also something that I had to discuss with my homeowner's insurance policy. And this was also something that since it is an owner-occupied mortgage and a multifamily, there are certain exceptions to our fair housing laws. And that was something that I still, once again, needed to do my due diligence with and contact my insurance broker. After calling Jay, that was actually the second person I called was my insurance broker. So one thing that was actually really helpful was that there was something in my lease that made it very clear that 
the prospective tenant needed to provide all of the information up front so that way we could properly vet them. And in this situation, unfortunately, that tenant did not do that. And we really, and then, so what I did was I, from your recommendation, I had sent her an email outlining that and explaining that unfortunately we were no longer to be able to move forward because it was already a breach of contract on day one of her even moving in. Um, and then I remember I sent that email. My husband actually was not home after that point in time because I called Jay back about 16 more times that day because <laughs> after I sent that email, the response that I had actually gotten back from that tenant was I got a phone call from her attorney immediately um, threatening to sue me. She then also threatened, well, it turned out to be more than just a threat, but she then also made it clear that her intentions were to call our local police to get them to force me to give her the keys to be able to move in. And she also made it very clear in her, in her written email. Jay, you always tell people, you gotta be careful what you put in writing. She literally wrote in her email to me that their intentions were to move into the property and then stop paying because they knew with COVID that they would not have to pay us that money. So if I had left those keys on that windowsill, they would probably still be living in that apartment. All my other tenants probably would have moved out because of the situation. And we would have had somebody that would be living there not paying for two years. Yeah. So, and she actually did that afternoon. The police did show up at my house um, and the police asked why they weren't able to move in. And I, I explained the situation. I said, you know, this is what's in my lease. This is the advice I was given from my attorney. And the police also agreed and said, unfortunately, this is a situation where the transaction did not take place where the keys were not handed over. So it's not that I was not allowing them into their home. It was at that point in time, the, the contract had already been ended based on their negligence. Yeah, it was void. And, and I'm sure yeah. the cops said that it was a civil dispute, not a criminal one. And yes, so they, they probably just responded to the call and did what they were supposed to do. And, uh, and that was that. And, you know, to some extent, you were lucky to have, you know, um, someone who clearly was more um, bark than bite, a lot of threats, um, a lot of insinuation, and uh, most I think would potentially cave to a scary situation, but because you were living there and because you had done your homework and because you were informed, you mm -hmm. were armed with something more powerful than what most other people might go into that confrontational situation uh, would be. And, and that was, I've spoken to my attorney, I've spoken to my homeowner's insurance. I know what the rights are. I know what the laws are and mm -hmm. here's what I'm going to do as a result. And I wish you well, <laughs> but someplace right. else. And, um, yeah, yes. <laughs> you, you did something that was protective of your other tenants. You did something that was protective of you from a liability standpoint. You knew that you weren't going to have mm -hmm. the protections afforded to you under your homeowner's insurance. And um, you really did an admirable job and you really deserve much of the credit. Um, I'm glad you called me. I love when you do. Yes. <laughs> um, I want to be there as, uh, like I've said in the past, everyone's worried all. You call me when you have a worry and then hopefully you're able to just deal with your worry on your own and it'll go away. Um, but you were great in that situation and you handled it um, very professionally. And, um, and I'm glad that we're able to move on from it. <laughs> All right. So then let's kind of shift from that situation. So I already kind of touched on this topic that we're going to kind of wrap up our interview here with. But one of the things that I had mentioned was that she made it very clear that her plan was actually to move in and then never pay us rent. So this is something that I know other lady landlords are out there handling. Um, and they're still in a position where we have tenants that are not necessarily paying. Do you have any, I guess, just overall general advice on what to do if one of our listeners out there has now a tenant that has been not paying. And once again, just as we talked about with ESAs, there are completely legitimate situations where that help is needed and should be afforded. But we are also in a similar situation with non-paying tenants. There are absolutely tenants right now that have lost their jobs that are in situations where they are really struggling financially. But there are also other people that are taking advantage of that situation. So from a general perspective, do you have any tips on what to do with just tenants not paying um, during this moratorium for, for certain states. Yeah, uh, and this is a very important topic for landlords right now. And I certainly don't have all of the answers and I'm not sure anyone out there does. Um, this is uh, somewhat of a moving target. This is things that clerks and judges and landlords and tenants and lawyers are all dealing with uh, in their own way 
Um, however, there are certain things that you can come to somewhat rely on uh, as it relates to landlord and tenant court, at least in New York City, uh, and maybe even outside New York City, but I'm a New York City attorney and my experience is primarily in New York City courts, is that there are an overwhelming number. I mean, when I'm telling you overwhelming number of petitions filed in the landlord and tenant court right now, it would make most of your listeners head spin. It was previously, prior to the pandemic, a zoo in landlord and tenant court where there were way too many filings and way too much for the judges to deal with that were sitting on the bench. Now you can multiply that. And I don't want to exaggerate, but it's got to be 10 to 20 times what wow. they were experiencing before. If I were to guess, it could be more. Um, mm. But here, here's the point that I'm going to make. The government has done its best to not have people thrown out on the street for lack of payment to their landlord, which again, as a landlord, well, how is that fair? You know, so most landlords, although I think customarily landlords are seen as the wealthy, big Goliath in the story, right? The tenants don't have the money. They're only renting. They're renting a part of a building that's very valuable, depending on where it's located. And the landlords make all the money. Well, mm -hmm. there are plenty of landlords out there. And you may be a listener that can probably uh, agree with what I'm about to say is just because you own property doesn't mean that life is easy street. There are plenty of expenses and things that you're responsible mm -hmm. for that are costly, stressful, and you might be making a nice living as a result of the income producing property, but not so much so that you can afford to assume that just your tenants aren't going to pay rent. So where does that leave us? So right now, the government, at least here in New York, has um, extended the deadline, the moratorium, as you mentioned, until January 15th. But what does that really mean? It means people aren't going to get thrown out on the street before then. However, it doesn't stop you as a landlord or prevent you from moving forward with an eviction with the right criteria. That criteria is, has your tenant provided you with the hardship documents that are required in order to buy the time that they're looking for in terms of the moratorium rules? If they haven't, or you question the veracity of the documents that have been provided or the story that's been told, you can call it into question. You have to provide notice. There's always the, the, the due process rules are in place. Don't take matters into your own hand. There's no self-help. Don't try to throw anybody out on the street or start threatening them. That's only going to get you into more trouble. But there are ways in which you can use the law and use the court system to get back in front of a judge to analyze the hardship, whether it's real or it's not. And if a judge decides that the hardship is not there, then there may be a way for you to proceed and continue to proceed along the eviction route or to collect rent or both. But you have to go through the process. You have to look into mm -hmm. it with your lawyer. And there are ways in which you can continue to proceed down a path if you feel it's inevitable that someone's not either not going to pay you or is in breach of their lease with you. Thank you. That was very clear and a great way to kind of walk us through what we should be doing in that situation. Now, last yes. question. Uh-oh, you I have a big you smile to, on your face too. I need, <laughs> I need you to end this debate for me. Uh oh. One of the hot topics is now with eviction moratoriums in many locations that it is more beneficial to do a month to month lease hmm. instead of a year lease for those long term rentals. So, if you can settle this for us, is there hmm. any benefit to changing the terms of the lease to fit our current situations? Well, that's such an interesting question, right? Um, my opinion, just an opinion. It's not the mm -hmm. end all be all because I'm sure someone could slap me in the face and say, well, Jay, you didn't consider this with your answer. I don't think that there's any benefit to changing a year lease to a month to month. And here's why a couple of reasons. Let's go pre pandemic. A month to month lease can be beneficial in certain, cer certain circumstances, but we're not going to get into that right now. 30, a month to month lease provides that a landlord can give 30 days notice and can remove a tenant upon that 30 day notice. But the, the same is true of the tenant. It empowers the tenant to give 30 days notice that we're leaving and then they're gone and they have no further legal obligation to you under that lease. I don't know, is that good or bad for your situation? You'll have to assess that. In a year long lease, they're responsible to you for a year. The landlord should not have to go out and have to find another tenant. Although the laws do favor uh, tenants in these situations who decide to walk out on their leases and turn over keys 
uh, with the mitigation rules that are now in place. But again, to consider reducing the amount of legal stranglehold that you have with a tenant, um, I don't see how that benefits you in any way. You would still need to go through an eviction process under a 30-day lease if that person was unable to be removed in some other way, like through a conversation, like you're supposed to leave now. Um, And if they don't, then you still have to go to court. There is no self-help that I'm aware of. You cannot lock their doors. You cannot go into their apartment. You cannot take their things and put them outside. You shouldn't even be threatening any of those actions at all that could put you in serious harm's way. So again, a 30 uh, month to month lease, I don't see how that empowers you in any way, shape, or form when it comes to the eviction process. But again, to each his own, every situation calls for a certain amount of analysis, and you may have a very good reason for wanting to enter into a uh, 30-day lease. Maybe you think that the value of the apartment in 30 days or 60 days or 90 days is going to go through the roof. It's going to get... It's going to become more valuable to find someone new. But in many cases, it's much harder to find tenants, especially these days for landlords. And to have somebody that's committed to you for a certain amount of time paying you rent is important and provides mm-hmm. a certain amount of, um, of comfort's the wrong word, but uh, you'll help me that's out. security. <laughs> but security, security, thank you. Not comfort. Yes, thank you. My son just yeah. walked in the room and said, hello. Hi, Oliver. No. <laughs> How was school? <laughs> <laughs> the benefits of working from home. Exactly. I'm no, now I'm picturing that video of the guy from like CNN, you know, it was doing oh, his with report the with in. the big map. Yeah. yeah, with yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah the nanny yeah. crawling on the floor. We've yeah. all seen that. Video, I wish right? I had an <laughs> accent too. It would make it that much more powerful. Clearly. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll redo the whole thing. You just have to speak in a British accent next time. Right. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Well, Jay, thank yes. you so much. I appreciate you walking us through some of these situations. There's a thousand more out there that we can kind of go through, but we're going to leave it here for today. So. Thank you very much for joining us on the Lady Landlords podcast today. For anyone in the New York area, I'm going to make sure to put Jay's contact information down in the show notes. So feel free to reach out to him to discuss some of your own situations and help with your real estate transactions too. And ladies, I will see you all next week for our next episode of the Lady Landlords podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Honor and a privilege. And if I can help in any way, I'm here to help. And Becky, your friendship and mm-hmm. everything else has, uh, has been great. And so I really appreciate you too. So thanks for having me on. Thanks, Jay.